All right, ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages, it's that time that you've all been waiting for, for which you have been waiting. It is a brand new episode of Student of the Gun Radio. Yes, indeed. I am her, your host, Paul Markle, uh, and you're about to hear all about it. Today, we're going to talk about uh, should New Jersey gun people have insurance? Do they deserve it? Uh, we talked, uh, what was it, about a, what, a couple weeks ago uh, about yep, the, uh, weeks. The, the new scheme that New Jersey, the, the, the communist regime in New Jersey has. They've granted themselves the authority to sue gun companies out of business. Uh, and how do you insure somebody who is in a state that is directly targeted by the communists? Uh, they, I mean, they're obviously high risk because the, uh, the state has said, hey, we're going to figure out a way to sue you out of business. Uh, and who will protect your kids? And how do you keep your dubers from falling off your gun? I don't know. We'll just talk about all that today on Student of the Gun Radio. Welcome to Student of the Gun Radio, planting freedom seeds since 2013. Here we don't just talk about guns and gear, we also discuss current events and politics. Because guns are politics. Now, sit back, relax, and allow today's episode to drift ever so gently into your ear. Please welcome your co-hosts, founder of Mastermind Media and Consulting Group, Jared Martin, and the shipping ogre, Zach Martin. Now, give it up for your beloved host, the pimp hand of America, Professor Paul Martin. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. I thought I had my, my phone on aeroplane mode, but apparently I didn't, and it's vibrating on the desk next to me, and I wanted to do that. So now it's on El Aereo Point. All right, so we're going to talk about Q's and A's. If you got Q's, we got A's. If you guys are uh, uh, on the studentofthegun.com slash Discord, if you are on studentofthegun.com slash Discord, uh, you can follow us all the time. And you can also commune with like-minded individuals on the Discord. Well, you don't even need to be there. You can talk to other people who are gun dudes and gun chicks and so forth. So... Uh, but we're going to go to our, uh, our first segment, which is our Brownells bullet points. And this is where we talk about stuff, hardware. This is our hardware discussion. we talk about dubers. <laughs> hey, Jared. So, uh, you know, if you... Did, were you ever in a class with uh, that was taught by uh, the the great one, the nightmare, Jay Gibson? Uh, I don't know if he was a primary instructor, but definitely he was an instructor for a couple of my classes. Yeah. How many times did he say duper? <laughs> it, it, between, I love the way he simplifies things. It's mm, amazing. It is. So. Uh, something that we're, we're talking about hardware and we're talking about things. Now, if you go to Brownells dot uh, um, obviously, uh, there are lots of things on Brownells dot com that you can attach screw uh, bolt onto your gun. And that that's a good thing, like optics and accessories and so forth. But you need to understand you need to come to the table with the realization that the more things that you screw onto, bolt onto your gun, attach to it, the more things that can and will fall off of your gun. Uh, and you don't, you're like, oh, no, man, I, I've gone to the range a bunch of times with this gun, and now nothing's ever falling off. Like, have you ever taken a training class with that? where you're not sitting at the bench, just farting around with your gun, where you're actually standing, moving, st sitting, you know, up, down, all that stuff. Jay Gibson, the, the nightmare, uh, he, he likes to tell stories about people who show up with, with a myriad of accessories bolted onto their guns and uh, how those accessories often end up on the ground, <laughs> Like, and if they don't, they're taken off by the person that's running the gun the second day. Yeah, and they show up with, with 10.6 pound guns on day one, and they come back on day two with seven pound guns. It's amazing. Oh, but one of the things that I appreciate about the training that I've received from a young age is mm -hmm. that 
you've always made sure that I've learned to use the minimal that I need to use, like iron sights or like when we did the precision rifle, I did most of my shooting out to thir- or a thousand yards, actually all the way up to 1400 with maximum six power. And I could dial in closer than that when I was reading the, when I was reading the, um, the Mirage, mm-hmm. but when I was actually pulling the trigger, I always did it with about you know, four to six power, depending on the distance. But the point that I'm making here is that I appreciate that I learned to use the minimum that I needed to use so that if I add anything else and it ends up failing for some reason, then I can just go back to the standard that the rifle comes with and I'll be perfectly fine. Yeah, there's nothing, you know, there's nothing wrong with red dot sights. I'm not yeah, saying, oh, yeah, I'm not oh, saying don't that. put a red dot on your gun. Here's, I'm not one of those guys, hey, you need to do your iron sights and put where it, uh, don't it's ever important rely. to have the skill as a foundation. Yeah. For sure. Don't ever rely. I, I love people say, I would never bet my life on anything that uses a battery. So you know, pacemaker. pacemaker. <laughs> That's funny. We went to the same spot. You have a, you have a, a, a smoke detector in your house. Yeah. What, what, what generate? Is it solar powered? How, how, how does your smoke detector work? What has a battery in it? So you're betting that that thing will work and will wake you up in the middle of the night. So the, you have a CO detector in your house. Well, yeah, I'm not stupid. How's that thing work? Well, it's, uh, it's plugged in and it has a battery backup. Why is it a battery backup? Well, it doesn't different. I've never bet my life on anything that uses a battery. Calm yeah, down. Cool. Then don't, yeah, you don't have calm to down. Years. calm down. Calm down. Uh, but yeah, things, anything with a thread. Okay. Guns move violently sometimes, and they and they move a lot. And anything with threads needs to have red locker. And I, Doug, if you're listening, I hope you're enjoying your retirement and your grandkids. Uh, but uh, my my buddy Doug, who was my firearms instructor in the academy, was the first person to hip me to this thing called Loctite. Thread locker. Loctite's a brand name like Kleenex or you know, Jello, uh, but it's a thread locking compound. And he told us, he, he said, with your handguns, your said anything with a thread, anything with threads, you need to pull the thread, pull the screw out, clean it with alcohol, take a, a Q tip and alcohol, clean it with alcohol, let it dry, then apply blue. Or green. See, back then there was two lot back in the when I was in the police academy thirty some more than thirty years ago, calm down. Um there were two block types. There was silver and blue. Silver was the I don't ever want to take this screw out ever again in my life. And if I do need to take it out, I'm gonna need a torch to heat it up to remove it. That's the was the silver. <laughs> and the blue was I won't want the screw to fall out, but I might in the future have to remove it. So I don't want it. I don't want the metal fusing together. Uh, so I'll use the blue. So Doug's like, get the blue, not the silver, get the blue. Uh, and like I said, this was in the early, early, early 90s. Uh, when when Jared was all of about, you were all of two years old. So, uh, mm-hmm. yep. Now, Loctite, the Loctite company has advanced uh, um, since uh-huh. then. And they've added, they've added new products and and so on and so forth. But oh, uh, uh, and if you follow the the link in the show notes, tunethegun dot com slash brownells, it'll take you right where you need to go. But what I am telling you is, is if you add anything, if it's an optic, you know, an optic uh, mount, whether it's a, a mini red dot. Uh, screws threads i mean i mean look look at how many if you put a, a an lpvo <laughs> if you put an lpvo on your rifle especially if you put it on your ar uh how many screws are in that setup you're like uh two four six eight a minimum of eight for the rings and then i got one you know, you could have 10, 12 screws uh, on it, you know, 
And every single one of those things could, I, I, when I was young, I will admit this when I was a young one, I, I, I there were, there were times when I, I looked down at my scope rings and out of the, the four back then we used had like two each out of the four, uh, screws three of them were present and one was not what happened to that screw well hmm. it's somewhere on planet earth uh you're like oh well, if it falls out if this if the screw falls out in the range i'll just pick it up off the ground <laughs> you ever drop a, a ring screw or a mount screw on the range <laughs> it's gone well, it's actually not gone. What will happen is in seven months, someone will be kneeling down to pick something up and they'll find a random screw on the ground. They're like, oh, look at that, a random screw. Where that came from? Looks like a screw from an aim point. <laughs> Looks like a hollow sun mounting screw. Yeah, how'd that get there? So do yourself a favor. If you are installing any kind of duber onto a gun, if it has the... the the, the simple rule is this. If it's on a gun and it has threads, it needs Loctite. It needs a thread-locking compound. I mean, you don't need a lot. You just need like a little, a little dabble, do you? Uh, but, uh, yeah, do yourself a favor. You, you'll be much happier uh, in the future uh, if you just go ahead and Put a little bit of Loctite on your screws. So that is your hardware discussion for today. And you can thank me later. Thank me now or thank me later. I don't care. I don't care. Yeah. All right. There are a Go. lot of companies now that are actually putting it on there. And the, like, oh, yeah. They, they apply to the screw. And I appreciate. If you're one of those companies and you're listening to us right now, thank you for doing that. I appreciate it. Oh, yeah. If, if you've ever gotten a screw set or a, a mount set and you open it up and you're like, what's this? Why are there little blue? Like, why is there blue? Like little blue dots or blue paint? Why is there blue paint on my screws? And I know a lot of people in there are like, Paul, I'm not an idiot. I know that the blue on the screws is Threadlocker. You know that because you're a smart student in the gun listener. But let me tell you, bro brothers and sisters, there are a lot of people out there. And some of them are Gen Z's that don't know why there's blue paint on the screws. Why did they put blue paint on the screws? I don't. I, I scraped that blue paint off before I put it in there, in the before I used it. I didn't want that on there. <laughs> it's not blue paint. It's thread lock, <laughs> and they put it on there for a reason. Like like Paxton used to say, for a reason. Hey, I did that for a reason. <laughs> oh also don't confuse your thread lock with your lubrication yeah don't put your thread lock compound and your in your loop right next to each other you don't want to mess those up uh high point high dash point what's what's i don't know what's going on um the 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 yc niner yc niner the Yeet Cannon, yes, indeed. I'm gonna, uh, YC9, I'm going to put that in there. Oh, the top result for YC9 is High Point Firearms Yeet Cannon. I was, I was kind of wondering if there were uh, there's something else on planet Earth that had YC9. Uh, I was looking something up yesterday. What the heck was I looking up? I can't remember. I put it into the search engine, and it came up, and it was not that at all. Oh, I know what it was. It was uh, One Box Workout, OBW. Uh, right, so I put in. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. There, there are a lot of other things that are OBW, um, and I, I also discovered. You know how like, um, what do they say is the sincerest form of flattery? Imitation. Imitation. Mm -hmm, yeah. How about intellectual theft? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. How about theft of intellectual property? Is Somebody that the sincerest form brain? of uh, of of uh, flattery? Yeah. So. When did we do the OBW? It was 2011. Uh, was that when we filmed it with Gun Talk? It was, or no, it was, was season when two. We, when we released no, it? No, Student of the Gun Television, season two, one box workout. Oh, okay, yeah. When we released it to the public. Yeah. So yeah, it, it, got, was, it got a resurgence after we, uh, we filmed did it, it with, with Gun Tom. Talk. Yeah. yeah. But the original one aired on the Sportsman's Ooh. Channel. <laughs> 
the the OG one box workout aired. Uh, it was either late eleven or early twelve uh, on television on the Sportsman's Channel, right? So it's it's been that long. Well, in twenty sixteen, a writer for SWAT Magazine came up with the the numeral one RBW. Or one, what do they put like one BRW or something? It's like the one box rifle workout. Like, yeah. And uh, so I looked, I was like, well, maybe he's going to acknowledge student of the gun and say, yeah. I got this. I got this idea from student of the gun. It even looked like pictures that you had taken. Nope. Nope. Just straight up intellectual property ripoff. It's like, I'm going to take this, rebrand it, or kind of almost rebranded and claim it was my idea five years after Paul did it. Well, congratulations to you. And I hope you do really well with your stolen idea, but that's not what I was going to talk about. today. <laughs> but that, that's, yeah, I put an OBW. If you put an OBW, you get lots of different things and not necessarily one box workout. But what happens if you put in BBW? <laughs> I'm not doing that. Yo, well, you guys are listening. I'm just curious what happens. Do that. Mm-hmm. And then let me know. Mm-hmm. But the original one box workout, the original one came from student of the gun. Uh, yeah, student of the gun. But uh, and so you put in YC nine and the YC nine comes right back straight back to high point firearms. And it's the Yeet cannon and they are available right now. Oh, if I you just want- opened up the chat for people that are here. Oh, did uh, you watching live? Yeah. And uh, David Lewis said, I've been choked out by Jay. <laughs> there you go there you go i don't remember that's in the advanced program they must have done a really good job <laughs> that's the advanced program uh that's that's in uh advanced fighting rifle not in basic they they used to yeah when i took the fighting rifle originally like way back when they had a lot of like cray cray drills in there and then when i when i took it again a few years later i asked james like what happened to that drill he goes yeah we moved that to the advanced one is we, we re-examine that and we're like, yeah, we, these guys aren't quite ready for that yet. <laughs> They're not quite ready for that yet. Yeah, but but yeah. the the original stuff, people were like, they couldn't believe it. I can't. What? Did you 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 did the uh, did you ever do the shaking the crap out of the student? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. So, but. We're not going to shake the crap out of the student. What we're going to do is we're going to go to Juxi.com, J-U-X-X-I, and check out the newest video uh, about the Galco Slick Slap Strap or Slick Sling. Uh, I think the official name is actually Slick Strap, uh, but it is a rifle sling, and it is a super handy. It's probably one of the most handy universal slings you're ever going to get your paws on. They go on sub guns. They go on rifles. They go on shotguns. They go yeah. Uh, and then you put them on your pistol if you want. I don't care. Um, yeah, yeah. Use it as to- use it as an emergency dog leash. You could use it as an emergency dog leash. I don't care. Uh, yeah. But it- go go watch that video, and you can get them from shopsotg.com. So Zach's going to put that up on yeah. the store. Watch a video, and if you're interested and you want one because it's so slick, ha ha ha. They're slick. They're and well. Simple. They call from. They come from Salt Lake City, right? That's right. Salt Lake City the SLC straps. strap. Yeah. Yeah. See that and. What? Mm-hmm. That, that that is a weird coincidence. But uh, <laughs> we we actually had a question from uh, in the video, Dad. You show that if your rifle does not have the rear sling loop, you can just loop it yep. around the stock. And somebody asked a question that I think is actually kind of pertinent. Um, mm-hmm. Would that could would that could that uh, interfere with the charging handle? Could it? Um, well, it could because anything could happen. Uh, is it, well, is I've it done. I, I have done that and run it like that. Uh, generally, what will happen is is it because it, it won't the the sling won't cinch down tight in that situation. Like it's not gonna it's not gonna cinch down so that it is immovable. You see what I'm saying? It, it won't be immovable. Uh, and you're like, well, if it's not immovable, I don't want it. No, it's not gonna fall off. It, it, you have to like. Use the the theater of your mind and imagine, you know, how I described it, how I showed it in the video. Uh, It's not immovable. 
If it was cinched down, immovable, yeah, it could. But because it's not, you can. Now, most of your M4, like your retractable stocks and, and your fixed stocks, they'll, they'll have a sling loop. Um, I was actually, I was I, th- that will happen or that would be more useful actually on an AK platform, uh, an AK rifle or an AKM than an AR. Uh, most of your ARs are going to have some type of capability uh, to mount one. Uh, but, well, you, well, you know, I, I, I know we're, we're, we're moving into a different era now, but if you had one of the original uh, shoulder, or not shoulder braces, stabilizing braces, if you had one of the original stabilizing braces, the, the original AR stabilizing brace, the rubber uh, one, they did not have uh, a place to install uh, a, a sling. So what you could do and what I did do uh, in, back in the, the days, can you believe it's, it's been over 10 years since the stabilizing braces came out. It's been over 10 years. Wow. So, uh, I'm yeah, you, you could use a slick strap for that and, it, and, and run it with no problem. Uh, but yeah, you're that situation. I, I get what they're saying and I, I understand that. Uh, and, and if it was fixed, cinched down in place right there, right behind the charging handle, uh, it could cause it, fit, but it, it's not going to because of the nature of the beast. Uh, and like I said, you probably, the chances that you would need that on a modern AR are pretty slim. Uh, I just did that because it was an example of how to do it. And there, there are AKs out there that don't have sling stock loops. Um, and, uh, you could do that. It, and there, there's, there's infinite different types of, of firearms out there that you could use in long guns. So, uh, yeah, the slick strap is, well, it's slick. And as soon as I discovered them, like, this is a, I love the simplicity of it. I love that it is that it is not complex. And that's something that we did during uh, in the very beginning of GWAT. Like manufacturers were losing their minds. What do you mean they're losing their minds? They were they were coming up with just they were overcomplicating everything. We went from a single point sling. We had, we had two point slings, then we had single point slings, and then there was a company that came up with a three point sling. And I'm like, just stop. You know, they, they had, to, they came with instruction manuals, how to wear your sling. I'm like, dude, if you got to give a PFC an instruction manual and, and like teach him a class on how to use the sling, that's probably a little more complex than it needs to be. You know, I'm, not a scientist here, but I'm guessing that's probably a little more complex than it needs to be. Uh, generally speaking, things accessories should be simple and straightforward, and that's what the the slick strap is. It is simple and it's straightforward, and uh, you know i I have no complaints with it, and I've been using them since they came out. Since since they introduced them, whenever however long ago that was, I've I discovered and I'm like, yep, this is it. I need many of these. <laughs> I need to always have one plus one of these, uh, and and I put them on. I've taken them, put them on and off guns for a long time. So that is my review of that. And if you want to see my my beautiful face talking about the slick strap, you can watch the video on Juxy.com. All right, let's uh, let me be quiet for a second. You guys open up both of your ears and listen louder. Attention new listeners. We produced a complimentary online training course called Seven Training Tips That Could Save Your Life. Get instant access by joining the Student Lounge for free at studentofthegun.com. Do you watch Student of the Gun TV, read the blog, and follow us on Facebook? If you answered no to any of these questions, you are wrong, but you can easily fix yourself. Go to studentofthegun.com to find everything SOTG. Yes, indeed. That's what you should do. That's what you should do. All right. Are we ready to move into the Student of the Gun homeroom? Brought to you by Crossbreed Holsters. Are we ready for that yet? I think we are. I think we are. All right. If we're ready, let's let's do it, man. I'm I'm excited. I'm pumped. Uh, 
Ah, that was dangerous by Madison Rising. Yes, we have express written permission to use that. So go fornicate yourself, YouTube. Oh, and Crossbreed Holsters, the homeroom is is all about what? Being what? Dangerous on demand. D-O-D. D-O-D. Not D-O-D. Dangerous on demand. D-O-D. D-O-D. Yeah. Not T, not, uh, not uh, C-O-D. There, there is a song called C-O-D by ACDC. It is on the album uh, for those about to rock uh, released. It is the album that followed up back in black for those about to rock was uh, actually a really good album. Um, but it was back in black. They should have waited two years, but I know how record producers are and I know how companies are. They're like, no, we got to hit while the iron's hot. We got to, we got to get another album out. We got to get another album out. And what no one did was they didn't, no one pumped the brakes and said, Back in Black is so hot that it's okay. We can wait two years and release the next album. Like, no, got to get another one out now. Cause that was the formula back then. Back then, you did it an, an album every year. Boom, 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 boom. Sometimes you did two a year. There were bands that would release an album in February and then another one in September of the same year. Look at the look at the 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 Kiss catalog. They 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 out released albums, two albums in the in one year. You're like, what? That's crazy. And you look today, and they and what do they do today? They take two and three years between albums, right? Because uh, the things changed. And you're like, is what the heck is this? Is this Dick Clark's Rock Roll and Remember? Is this is this Music Education uh, by Paul Markle? Well, it could be, but we're not going to talk about that. We're not going to talk about COD or DOD. We're actually going to talk about DOD. Christian school security. And you're like, why are you talking about Christian school security? Well, because I don't believe that secular schools, uh, I don't believe they can be saved. They're run by communists. And sorry, sorry, not sorry. This is one of those sorry, not sorry things. You know, people are like, Oh, but come on, Paul, but come on, man. It's like, mm, here's the deal, man. We've been playing this game for a long, long, long time. And you, I say to you, when are things going to get better and when are they going to improve? You're like, I don't know exactly. But I believe Christian schools can be saved because they have some autonomy and they have control over what they do, whether it is a um, – Christian charter school or private school or what do you call parochial, you know, parochial school or, you know, it could be a Jewish school. Uh, do the do the Hodge have their own schools, Jerry? I'm not sure. They have like dedicated like Hodge only schools. I'm sure that they do. Do they? I think they just send their kids to public schools. I'm not sure. I know here, <clears throat> or at least the the people that I know send them their kids to. Uh, What's the one called where it's it's a charter school? A charter school. Yeah. The answer is yes. There, yeah, you, know, you could find a list of of like exclusive schools in America. Oh, okay. But what we know, if we're honest, we're intellectually honest with ourselves. If if we're willing to be honest, uh, religious slash Christian, basically it's Christian Jewish schools uh, are, are are targeted are being deliberately targeted. Christian daycares, Christian schools, Jewish schools, um, they're being deliberately targeted by evil people. And to say, well, I don't like that. That that those facts make me uncomfortable. Okay, that's nice, but that doesn't solve the problem. Uh, and refusing to acknowledge the problem doesn't make the problem go away. So what we need to ask ourselves is. Who is better suited or who would be better suited to secure and protect a Christian school? Volunteers or hired guns? Um, well, obviously, you know, you say hired guns, but what does that mean? Well, I mean, hired guns is subcontracting violence. That's that's what Scott says, right? Subcontracting. Carl. Hmm? Carl. Yeah. Carl. Carl. Yeah. Sorry, Carl. Uh, yeah. That's what we do. 
we subcontract by our violence. We, we, we pay others to do violence on our behalf because we don't want to do it because it's dirty and, you know, and it's, whether it's below us or whether we don't feel qualified to do it. So what we do is, is we're like, well, I would never do that myself. See, that's what Democrats, Democrats love to, to subcontract violence. You know, that, that, uh, that, um, traitorous piece of human filth, uh, from California, Eric Swallow, Swallow Well or Swallow Well or whatever his name is. Um, he wants to pass a law in direct violation of the United States Constitution. Uh, that makes it illegal for you to own an AR. He hates ARs, uh, even though the AR is the most <laughs> is the rifle in most common use in the United States of America. And he's proposed that um, that people can either voluntarily surrender them to the government, or they will send Gestapo agents. They will send agents of the state out to take it away from you. And the reason I bring this up is because Eric Swallowell is not going to be at the front of the stack. Eric Swallowell will not be on your front porch beating on your door demanding you give him your guns. See, they don't ever do that. They they subcontract out the violence. They they create the situation and they sell, send other people out to do violence on their behalf. You know, the, the, the people that are rattling, the, you know, they're dancing in the blood of, of children, they're never going to, like, go out to do what they want done. They'll send other people to do it. Democrats love to subcontract violence. They love to hire other people to do violence on their behalf. When it comes to protecting our children in our schools, we need to ask ourselves, who is best suited to protect them. Now, I know there are people out there who are like, well, come on now, you know, uh, you can't have amateurs and, and, and just citizens carrying guns because they're not qualified. Only the police are qualified. Why? Well, because they're trained professionals. That's a cool story. That's a cool story. You tell yourself that at night before you go to sleep, makes you feel good. Uh, yeah, they, they went to a class, and they, they were taught how to use that thing. But the idea that every person who puts on a polyester uniform um, is a firearms expert is laughable. It is laughable. And it's not even a funny joke. It's a sick joke. There are a lot of volunteer citizens who are far more qualified to use a firearm in defense of innocent lives than the vast majority of the dudes walking around in polyester uniforms. And if you're one of those dudes in a polyester uniform and you, you want to go ahead and get butt hurt, get in the line. Write me a letter. Send me, actually, uh, you can send a letter directly to me uh, at P.O. Box 405 Boulder, Colorado. Um, but make sure if you want to reply, you put a self-addressed stamped envelope in there. Uh, and we'll get right back to you. But ladies and gentlemen, look at what we've experienced in our schools with the hired guns. We have two major nation, nationwide or national, international incidents where the people in polyester uniforms either stood, stood around while children were slaughtered or ran away while children were slaughtered. And what have we been what have we been thumping for a long time? Who has the opportunity in the event of of an attack, an active shooter, an attack in a school, a mall, a church, a fill in the blank, who will have an op opportunity to make a positive difference in the outcome? Only who? The people that are there already. Yes. Only the people who are present that at the moment it begins, those are the only people who will have an opportunity to, to change the outcome. 
The first responders will not. They, they, you know, they might surround the place, the mall, the church, the school, the whatever, and then after the, the shooters are done committing the, ma- the mass murder or they run out of ammo or they get bored, like in, uh, in the case in, in Parkland, kid just got bored, walked out, just had so much, had so much time on his hand that he just got bored and was finished and walked away. That's pathetic. Only the people who are present when it happens will have the opportunity to make a positive outcome. And the positive outcome could be the immediate cessation of hostilities by gunfire. And who does that? Is it possible to train adult volunteers? And when I say volunteers, I don't mean random strangers off the street. I mean the gym teacher, the shop teacher, the, the history teacher, the vice principal, the principal, the, the dean of students, the, you know, fill in the blank. Is it possible for those people to be trained so that they become not only competent, but confident that they can do what needs to be done in the event of an emergency? Yes, it's absolutely the idea that somehow um, once you, you, you put on a, a polyester uniform, you become this uber genius and you get this magical ability to use guns that, that nobody in mere civilian clothes could ever have uh, is ludicrous. And uh, you're not going to give me a ludicrous reference. I... Luda. The only one I can think of I'm not going to give you right now. Luda, Luda, back up. You don't know me like that. There we go. Yeah, that's the right. The one I could think of was the, uh, I Get don't even back, know the name of the song. My friend, that's right. you don't know me like that. <laughs> Isn't it called Get Back? Zach, what's that, what's that ludicrous song where he's like? It is, is indeed called Get Back, yes. Get Back, my friend. You don't know me like that. Oh, uh, but yeah. And, and so if we come to the realization, because here's the thing, like those people, the, all the people that I just mentioned, the gym teacher, the history teacher, you know, the football coach, the, the assistant principal, the dean of students, the principal, you know, all those people are going to be there anyway. They're going to be there anyway, right? They're going to be all over the school anyway. So why not make those people, have them, not make them, not force them, but create. Why not create a trained volunteer security person, protector, a person who is capable in an emergency, in a crisis? I mean, I know that they teach, that they force teachers to go through the fire training. They have to know where the fire extinguisher is. When I was in school, one of the things during the fire uh, drills was uh, I remember a teacher going to where the fire extinguisher was. Like, are they firemen? The teachers aren't professional firemen, but we can teach a, uh, a gym teacher, or a history teacher, or a second grade teacher to grab up that object, pull the pin out, squeeze it, and put the fire out. We can teach them to do that, right? And we can teach adult volunteers. You say, and, and if you've got people in your, in your school, adult humans, that you think are not responsible or mature enough to be in possession of a firearm, you know you're, you're putting your children in their care, right? I've had people like, oh, come on, you can't just like, you, you can't have or expect teachers to go to training and, and to carry a gun. That's the soul. Well, we don't even know if they're safe or responsible. Like, you don't know if they're mature, safe, or responsible enough for that, but you're going to put, you're going to send your kids to them every day to be indoctrinated. You know they're in charge of your kids all like five days out of the week, right? Don't you think you, and if those people aren't mature and responsible, why are you sending your children there? They, that's the people that are supposed to be caring for your kids. And looking out for their welfare, 
making sure they don't jump off the roof of the school or, you know, play with power saws or, you know, whatever. So (laughs) this is when you say, Paul, when are you going to stop writing books? Uh, I don't know when I'm dead. Oh, this stuff needs to get written down. So what I've been doing, I've been engaging in a, uh, in a, a program of writing down as much as I possibly can, getting all of the thoughts out of my brain onto paper so that they are available to my sons to have, so that they never have to say, well, you never told me that, Dad, or I don't remember you saying that. And sometimes they say, I don't remember you saying that. But now I can say, well, you might not remember me saying that, but I wrote it down. Jared, Zachary, (laughs) I wrote it down. Yes, you did. And and my sons get a little frustrated with me. and They're like, slow down on the writing stuff. We didn't catch up with the last one yet. And I say, I can't slow down. Don't know how much time I have left. Don't know how much time we have left. It's got to be done. So, I did another thing. And uh, you hopefully you'll be seeing reviews of this book or hearing reviews very soon because we sent this book out to uh, respected professionals in the firearms industry. Um, And I'm hoping uh, that those reviews are going to hit very soon. Now, do I expect or believe that every Christian school, Hebrew school, whatever, in America is going to appreciate this and implement it? No. I wish they would but I know they won't say, well, why did you do it? Because I have the experience. I have the, the training, the knowledge and the experience providing executive protection, bodyguarding security. So I put it all down. I wrote it down. I detailed it and I put it out there. I can't make people accept it. It's, it's, like, it's like being a, an apostle man or it's like being an evangelist or like, it's like delivering the message. All I can do is deliver the message. I can't make you accept it. I can't make you appreciate it. I can't make you do anything. But if I deliver the message and you hear the message and you say, that's nice, but I don't care. That's nice. I don't want that information. It makes me uncomfortable. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to think that a bad person, a a minion of Satan, would come into my kids' Christian school and murder them. I don't want to think about that. makes me uncomfortable. Cool. It's not going to change the outcome. It's not going to stop it. Your your feelings aren't going to do anything. Jared, it's it's like the insurance thing, which we're going to talk about here in just a second. Uh, can you stop a hurricane from coming to Florida? No, you can't, right? Depends on who you ask. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, or can, if we pay enough carbon credits, no, you can't stop the world from being what it is. What you can do is you can, you have the power to decide how you're going to react to that. You don't have the power when you walk out of your front door, when you go and stop to fill up your your truck, your car, whatever, and you walk into the gas station and there's an a-hole standing there with a gun in the clerk's face and he looks and he sees you, uh, you can't prevent that from happening. You can What you can do is decide how you're going to react to that, what you're going to do. You can't stop someone from coming through the intersection and smashing into your car. You're sitting there doing what you're supposed to be doing, you know, or you're going through a green light and somebody runs a red light. You couldn't stop that from happening, but you can decide what you're going to do. You cannot stop maniacs from trying to come to Christian schools, but you can decide what you're going to do if that happens. You can prepare. You can be, you can... You can either ignore it and hope that it never happens. And Jared, that's exactly what uh, some like 
You know, well, I'm going to get the cheapest, crappiest insurance that I could possibly get because, and I'm betting that nothing bad will ever happen. Or you can just say, well, I, you can accept the fact that you can't change how other people behave. You can't change what evil people do, but you can change how you re- behave, you react to it. You can change your preparedness level. And if you want the information, it's there. It's available to you. And the, the other thing that, that I, I want to touch on real quick is I'm really glad that we had that conversation, Jared, about the, uh, the uh, is, is it run by the Mormons, the school that, where they have, where they open carry, not concealed carry? Yeah, yeah, it's a, a Mormon. LDS school? I don't know what you would call it, but it, it is, it's run by the Mormons, but they, it's not just a Mormon school. There's people of all faith denominations that go there. Yeah. So, you know, my original thought was, well, you know, the con- concealed and, and that, you know, that's generally where everybody in our, our culture will go. They're like, concealed is the way to go. You should never open carry. And anybody who says you should never, ever open carry ever under any circumstances, ever, 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 never, 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 ever, never, 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 because well, you're not thinking. Uh, police officers open carry every day. Yeah, but they're allowed because they have polyester uniforms and they work for the state. And you don't. Well, is there a time for good people to be armed and for people to know that the good people are armed? Yes, there are times when when the people need to know that the good people are armed. Now, if you're the only person, if you're like the only one with a gun on, then you become the that one lone weirdo. But if there's 10 of you, you're like, oh, this is a thing. In the school that we're talking about, the security people at the school don't concealed carry. They're volunteers, they're members of the staff, they're trained, they're armed, and they open carry they carry openly you're like that's crazy calm down there's two good reasons for that number one that the 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 really the important reason or one of the important reasons i don't know which one's more important is to show the students and their parents but mostly the students that guns are not evil guns in and of themselves are not bad things because that's what the other side says The other side is trying to convince our children that all guns are bad unless the state controls them, unless cops have them. If uh, police officers are allowed to have guns because they work for the state and the government, but otherwise they're bad and bad guns bad. By having trusted, respected adults be armed, and armed so that the children see that the trusted, respected adults are armed, you remove that stigma that all guns are evil. You're like, you know what? Good people do carry guns. Good people use guns to keep us safe. And then the other one is what just the, the reason that that he, she lunatic in Nashville chose that school was because he, she, it knew that school didn't have armed security and they knew they could get away with it. So these people are cowards. They don't want to fight. They're not showing up to get into a gunfight. They're showing up to murder. They're showing up to commit carnage. They're showing up to kill as many innocent lives, to take as many innocent lives as they can before someone stops them. So by having armed staff members be obviously armed, you're telling a potential minion of Satan, oh, you can try it. You can come and try, but you're not going to get far. You should probably go somewhere else. It's called hardening the target. It's called hardening the target. So those are actually, and you say, well, our school, we're, we put up placards. What is more convincing, Jared, or Zach, or anybody who wants to answer, 
What's more convincing to a potential bad person, a plastic sign or the gym coach standing on the sidewalk watching the school bus get loaded and unloaded with a pistol on his hip? Anybody yeah, the, can put up a plastic actual sign. Real human there, but the plastic sign has a gun on it, so maybe they'd be afraid of that too. Who knows? Yeah, they might be afraid of the picture of the gun. So, uh, the new book is called "Knights of Saint Nicholas, Protector of the Children," and we we dive into what we just talked about and a lot more. So, if you're interested in that, great. If you're not, that's cool too. All right, now we're it's time for the special guest, and I'm excited about this. Uh, you've heard him here before. And uh, like I said, we talked about a couple weeks ago what, what's going on in New Jersey. Uh, New Jersey State has granted itself the authority to sue gun companies out of business, uh, you know, and it's really arbitrary. And it's not for committing crimes or breaking the law. It's for actually engaging in lawful commerce. So you could be in New Jersey engage, following their rules and restrictions and all of their crap, and still the state will sue you out of business. How do you insure something like that? Well, I don't know, but I know who does. And his name is Rick Lindsay. And so the next people you hear are going to be Jared and I and Rick Lindsay from X Insurance. So perk up your ears, freaks. All right, ladies and gentlemen, once again, we have a special guest. It is Rick Lindsay from X Insurance. X going to give it to you. They're going to deliver it to you. X going to give it to you. And uh, we were hypothesizing a couple of weeks ago about New Jersey and how they recently granted themselves the authority to sue gun companies out of business um, for not for committing crimes, not for breaking the law, but for engaging in lawful commerce. So my, my hypothesis was, well, if we know that that's the case and we know that they're already targeted, how do you insure somebody that's being targeted directly by the state? And can you insure somebody that is? And should you insure somebody that is? And what happens to the premiums when a company becomes a known high risk? And rather than try and answer that myself, because I am a neophyte, we brought on Rick Lindsay. Rick, good morning. How are you guys? Fantastic. Thanks for inviting me. So I'm guessing you've heard about this New Jersey nonsense. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's not surprising to me. It's like everything else. You know, you you kind of pick a path. You make decisions, good decisions. You end up in a better place. Bad decisions, you know, you, you end up in a very different place. So, you know, when you guys hit me up on this, I think the real problem started with Remington. Right, and I don't like lawyers, um, you know, but their job is to shoot the gaps like linebackers in the football game. And, you know, Remington screwed it all up. I mean, they basically listened to the lawyers, hopefully to, you know, avoid going bankrupt, and they went bankrupt anyway. So to me, that was kind of the beginning of the end. And I would tell you that you know, I started in 1985 ensuring high-risk rafting and mountain climbing that was uninsurable. So, you know, the thing that makes it uninsurable is people buy insurance like an idiot. And I'd have to tell you, the gun industry is kind of leading the way. You know, I've been offering gun manufacturers and gun people good insurance, real insurance, for a long time. But they all make bad decisions and they buy cheap shit insurance hoping that they're never going to have a claim, just like Florida homeowners, right? They'll take your money because they think you're not going to have a claim. Then when you have a claim, they basically don't pay you because of the fine print and exclusion. So, so rather than talk about the price of something, let's talk about what, when, what can happen, does happen. What's the play? Like going to the Super Bowl, you know, when you end up in the Super Bowl as a team, you have your one-yard line plays. Everybody knows their job. You practice them, and you're all on the same page. We go to court like amateurs, right? And the lawyers are always going to tell us to settle everything, 98% of all cases settle, because everybody's afraid. 
So, you know, when you're right, you do not negotiate with terrorists. You go to court and, you know, just like in California, when people would die doing an adventure sport, it was uninsurable and you had to pay them. Release forms were no good. I took that case to the Supreme Court in California and literally at that point in the late 80s, you know, proved all the lawyers wrong. Release forms are good with the right facts and the right execution. But, you know, execution takes a good insurance partner. I need a good insurance who's not going to listen to the lawyers. So, you know, the lawyers are doing their job in New Jersey. The lawyers are always behind, you know, legislative changes. And, you know, this immunity that the manufacturers have had, everybody's really afraid of that going away. But if you don't defend yourself, if you settle, you don't you don't get the benefit of it anyway. So, you know, to me, this is just now it's a bigger battle and we need to get better and challenge this. You know, if, again, if they do something wrong, um, then, you know, you should do the right thing and pay the claim. But if you didn't do anything wrong, you never settle because that's like the first stone in the wall and you get weaker and weaker. So, you know, gun industry needs to make better decisions. Quit listening to lawyers. I talked to the head guy at Remington. They brought him back to try and save the company. And I said, so who is the genius lawyer who, you know, talks you guys into settling this? And he told me the firm, you know, my company's based in Chicago. I know the firm. They're the crappiest law firm on the planet. They're big. I would never use them because they don't want to listen to me. And, you know, I'm kind of risking my own money. So I feel like I have more skin in the game. And the insured, in this case, the gun industry has more skin in the game. So lawyers are a tool that we use. They're not, you don't let them fly your plane into the mountain like Remington did. So to me, this is just basic common sense. It's, you know, the law that they've, you know, put in place there. You know, I was told I couldn't sell firearms liability in New York and and Washington. I don't sell firearms liability. I cover you, the person, or the business. And firearm, you know, knife, doesn't matter how you protect yourself. As long as you're doing what's right, we should fight for what's right. So it, let's say, all right, so a, a, a uh, whether it's a wholesaler, distributor, dealer, whatever, I don't think, are there any actual manufacturers in New Jersey? I don't think there are. But uh, a wholesaler, retailer, if somebody in the gun business comes to you in New Jersey and says, hey, I want a new policy, uh, you say, great, awesome, let's do it. Or what, what is your advice to them? Well, I want to I wanna get a sense for how legally naive they are and who are the lawyers or trusted people that they're going to listen to, you know, over me. I, I don't think they should listen to anybody over me if I'm their insurance partner. And I've been doing this for 40 years and when in lawsuits that lawyers tell me I can't win, don't listen to them, we go win. So, you know, to me, New Jersey is, it's like legal hell holes. You know, they've been passing out that fake news now for like 10 years. There's a list of the 10 worst venues, you know, Chicago, New Orleans, South Florida. I win lawsuits there all the time, but I got to have good facts and I got to have a good partner and we have to be patient because the, the legal system is very slow and people get scared. So many cases, people who have had claims are more, they're not as naive, right? And they actually realize that if they take the wrong turn and settle cases they shouldn't, they're not going to have a business down the road. You're settling yourself right into oblivion. Uh, the, the idea that we can compromise with people that are seeking our destruction and they'll just destroy us slower or less you know, uh, is it's crazy. Uh, you know, it goes back to the back to the 60s, 70s, 80s uh, during the you know, with the Israeli policy of never, ever, ever, ever negotiate with terrorists. And other people were other countries were and they pressured Israel. NATO did. Europe did. The United States did. 
They pressured Israel. Oh, the news is reporting this terrible thing, and you've got to do something to relieve this problem. And to their credit, I don't know how they would handle it today because, quite frankly, Israel's kind of gone down the toilet. But um, back then, th- their, their way of negotiation was to send a, a team of commandos down to Antebbe and raid the plane and you know, take care of business. But for, for those of you that don't know on the raid on, on Antebbe, you're, you're young and you should study history. But, uh, but the, the thing is, it, we, the, the Israelis never lost after Antebbe. They never lost an airliner, not one. When we were having, we, you, you remember the the planes hijacked to Cuba? Uh, the, the it was it almost became a joke, Rick, about like we're going to Cuba. It, 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 so it was almost like every other day someone was jacking a plane and they were gonna they were trying to fly it to Cuba. And oh. uh, but Israel it hasn't lost one plane. They to hijacking because they won't negotiate, and they wouldn't negotiate. I mean, I, I, I relate everything to really simple stuff. This is all like when we were kids on the playground with the bully. And, you know, once there was always the little guy who punched him in the nose, got sick of him. And then we all were like, oh, the bully's not that tough. And, you know, in adult life, the legal system in this country has been, you know, fake news that it's not fair and you can't be treated right. I, I disagree with that. But you have to have a play and the partners. You know, like when you used to pick your football team or your steal the tick team um, when you were kids on the playground, you knew who to pick. You knew who the fast kid was. You knew who the good blocker was. Today we buy insurance like idiots and we just buy the cheapest thing. We don't ask, well, what, what are we going to do when this claim occurs, when I get sued frivolously? So – Everybody I insure, I talk to and I ask them that. I say, look, let, let, we're not going to talk about price and quoting you until we have a plan and a play. Now, you know, will you live up to the plan and the play? Will you actually do what we've agreed to under pressure? You know, that's when you really find out, just like friends on the playground. When it was a fight, some of your friends would run home. Some would fight with you. Same thing. Well, now if there's a fight on the playground, they call a SWAT team. And- <laughs> <laughs> they let them rob the stores, but they go get the kids on the playground. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's the, that's the latest one. I just saw that this morning when I, when I was going prepping the show notes, a story out of uh, Washington, D.C., where Giant Foods is going to remove um, attractive items. They're, they're going to remove brand name items that are that are being stolen from the store. So in, so they're just going to take it away, like Schick razors and Tide detergent and you know stuff like that. They're just going to not stock it anymore. Because one way to do it. Of, well, that's one plan. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Make a good decision or a bad decision. No, no one gets to have any. They're like, so they're, man, these things haven't been selling for like five years, but we've kept on the shelves. Finally, we've got a reason to get them off the shelves. No, nah. uh, I don't understand that. Why? <clears throat> I mean, this kind of goes into the, the the discussion that we're having about New Jersey gun companies. It's I don't understand why a company would apply a half solution, especially if it's going to cut into their profits, because that's the whole purpose of having a company is to support you, yourself, your employees, the executives, the board, the investors. And if you're cutting the ability, if you're cutting that out of your your business, then you're not just going to hurt it down the road by settling and having to you know defend yourself again for the same thing because you didn't fight back the first time you're going to lose profits along the way and it's going to make it more difficult to fight back the second time because you're not going to have as much money doesn't make sense to me no but if it's a distributor or a firearm sale guy in new jersey you know you you do want to make sure that you're you know thinking ahead of the ball and, and, you know, being a lot more aware that, yeah, if I do this and this guy goes and does something with this weapon that, you know, maybe I should slow down and, and not be so excited here because it is going to ruin my future. So, you know, again, I, I, I want to talk to every business owner 
I want to understand how they conduct and operate their business. Because the lawyers, again, when 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 the bad thing happens, when what could happen does happen, they're going to say you should have, you should have, you should have. And it's not that hard to anticipate what they're going to claim you should have done. And you should have you should, you should have waited longer. You shouldn't have you know sold it right on the spot or. And I did jet ski, you know, some guy walks up to rent a jet ski and he's a total, you know, jerk. Why, why would a jet ski rep, you know, those are the types of things I've been dealing with for 40 years. Good people who operate their own business, they see trouble coming. Good guides, you know, when you show up on a river trip for the Grand Canyon and, you know, the, the jerk shows up in every bunch, you as the head guide should put him in your boat. And, and you control him and you manage him because last thing you want to do is let him be a jerk. And then you get to evacuate him from the Grand Canyon and deal with the lawsuit later. And again, it's, it's about having foresight. You know, it's not being a fortune teller, but I mean, once you've been doing this stuff long enough, you can, can you know, see trouble coming. But if you're an absentee owner and you're on the beach drinking Mai Tais and you've got a crew back there running it, you know, they're not going to make the same decisions. They need good leaders. And that's, you know, that's what I basically try and do for my people. I don't want to make them scared, right? I'll make the tough decisions. What's the right price? What's the right plan? Do we fight or win? And, you know, when we get in a fight and the people get scared, I tell my team, call me in, you know, let me talk to the insured. I talk to them. You know, before the bad thing happened and we had a plan, so let's sure up the plan. And, you know, a lot of people get scared and, and listen to the lawyer. And I, I don't get mad at them anymore. I used to. Now I'm just like, okay, dude, you're the boss, right? You get to make the decision, but we had a deal and you're now changing the play on me. So I'm going to pay the claim like you want me to. But that hurts everybody. Just like when we won the case in California, Saint versus Whitewater Voyages, it helped everybody nationwide since the late 80s now benefit from that win. Had I settled it, they'd still be saying, well, these firms are no good. Mm. From, from a larger standpoint, you know, I know a lot of people in America who are not gun people or even if they're just fringe gun people, they see this thing in New Jersey and they're like, eh, well, it's just New Jersey and, you know, what are you going to do? But what happens to an economy, what happens to a nation when you allow these these leftists, these liberals to just grant themselves the authority to sue companies out of business? And, and you, 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 I'm, I know you're absolutely right. It's, it's the attorneys behind it pushing the legislation through. But this is this doesn't end at guns. If people are like, well, I don't care about guns and I don't like guns anyway. So blah, blah, blah. It doesn't end at guns. It starts at guns. And then it moves to automobiles. And then it moves to, uh, you know, anything. It doesn't matter. Pizza stove. Pizza stove. Now you can't have a pizza oven that burns wood. You yeah. know, the, the fancy pizza. They want to get rid of those. I mean, literally everything is under attack. And, you know, again, I think that's part of the their, you know, their organized attack on the things they don't like. And, you know, it's really sad that, you know, New Jersey, everybody can say, oh, it's only New Jersey. It's coming to the other states. Right? There's some states, Montana, Utah, Wyoming, you know, they'll be the last ones because I think we're pretty freedom-loving people out there. But, you know, it, it doesn't stop at New Jersey. we got to take it on to New Jersey through a strategy and a plan. And, you know, Remington, again, a good example, they bought cheap insurance where the fine print, you know, doesn't really work and they didn't have a play and it hurts the whole industry. Well, you know, so you bought cheap insurance. How much did you save in the long run? You didn't save anything. It costs you so much more money in the long run because all you want is cheap insurance. And so, you know, the people that I help, they broke through that mental um, you know, roadblock that, you know, it's cheaper for me to buy the right insurance and have a plan um, that protects my future. I was just like all these Florida homeowners, you know, no flood. Lawyers have been making money for 50 years arguing over wind and flood. If you have flood, it's from a separate company. 
And the answer is, in my approach, I give you everything you need, wind and flood. We're not going to argue about it. If I insure your home and it's damaged in the storm, we're just going to come fix it. We're not going to look at what's wind and flood. Uh, these solutions are so simple, it's ridiculous. I'm telling you, it's, it's amazing to me that we listen to all these overeducated people you know, insurance lawyers, defense lawyers, plaintiffs lawyers, actuaries, you know, these big, huge companies that are, you know, really failing us, AIG, CNA, they've been doing this hundreds of years, and people think they know what they're doing. I would tell you I'm proof that they really don't know what they're doing. They've evolved in a direction and a trend that hurts their insurers, doesn't help them. Their actual plan is to take your money and you pay your own claim, like a flood. Or, you know, if you have claims, they normally raise your deductible to $100,000. Well, almost 90% of your claims are going to be under $100,000. So they took your money and now you pay your own claims. And so one of my, you know, platforms now is get rid of deductibles. They pit us, the insured and the insurance company, against each other. We're working against each other. The roofers show up and say, oh, you got a roof deductible. I can work that into the bid. So my approach is we share risk on a percentage basis. So instead of a $100,000 deductible or 10%, and you pay the first, if you have a $100,000 uh, claim, you're paying the whole thing. Under my approach, you would pay 10% or 10000 and I would pay ninety. But we're working on the claim together. You're reporting your claims because we're both going to pay on every claim. And that is such a simple, common-sense approach to aligning your interests with people you're doing business with that the, the big boys should do it. But I, I don't believe they ever will. I hope they do because it will help our industry stop feeding the lawyers. I yeah, I have real genuine fear and trepidation for the future of our industry. Uh, just because it, it seems like the people that are running the industry now, or the people that are coming into the, into the industry, the they're just they're they're standard cookie cutter business people. They went to the school, the business school, and they learned the whatever. Uh, and it's like you know. These, these people that at uh, Remington, the, the ones that are the Freedom Group and so forth, they weren't gun culture people. They're business people uh, who were just selling a product. Right. To them, it's just, it's like a hammer or a power drill or whatever. It's just a product you sell to American rednecks so they can give you money. And when you have a situation like that. Well, when guns, when, when guns go away, they're going to take your hand. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, you, you know, what, what do we do? And, and, and I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm really genuinely uh, afraid for the future of our industry, especially. So we have the Remington debacle and the, and that, and it, but then you also have the situation where you have this artificial economy where sales were artificially increased. They, and to a point where that really shouldn't have been, but you know, and now they're down to where they actually should be in a realistic situation in a realistic world. And everyone's freaking out. They're like, sales are down. We're losing money, blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, you're not actually losing money. We're like, yeah, but sales were up so high. I'm like, yeah, that was artificial. That wasn't natural. Uh, it was, it was something that, that it was just a spike. But when you have a company that can't understand, that can't forecast future, you know, uh, highs and lows. We have companies in our industry that I, I don't, you know, I literally asked like, did you expect the sales spike from 2020 to just go until the end of time? It was just going to like go up and up and up and up and up and up and up. Did you not expect or anticipate a slump? And, and so they're like, oh, we're in a slump. And I'm like, yeah, no kidding. What did you expect? And they're like, well, we, we don't even know if we're going to, you know, we're going to have to cut costs. We're going to lay people off. We're going to do all this stuff. I'm like, what did you think was going to happen? And that's scary when you have people running big companies. Not, I'm not talking about like four people. I'm talking about companies that employ 50, 100 people and, and they got a, a sales slump and they're, they're just freaked out about it. 
and they're wringing their hands and they're you know they're sweating and I'm like wow. Well, you know what you're describing there is that it's just like insurance companies. I mean, all these big companies, Chubb, and they've been taking people's money in California and Florida for years. And now they're all waking up to the fact that they can't write insurance in California and Florida anymore because of, you know, they call it global warming. I call it storms and cycles. But, you know, the farmers, all state, all of them have announced they're not writing homeowners in, in Florida anymore. Now, they all claim that it's because they can't get the rate increases from the insurance departments. So, you know, if you can't increase your rates based on what's going on, and, you know, their rates have always been too cheap, again, because their underwriting process is where they're only writing people that they think aren't going to have a claim. That's why anybody that has a claim, they cancel. So, you know, you're good until you have a claim. And I would I would tell you that most people have claims. They just don't report them. Because they know that there's going to be a backlash. And, you know, I, I think we take your money because you can't have a claim. And why wouldn't you report every claim? You know what happens when you report a claim late? It's denied for late reporting. I mean, that's how stupid this stuff is. And they just, in Florida, they double the price and they double the deductible. The last storm, they didn't pay anything. The guys paid their own claim under their deductible and you know you don't need to double the deductible you don't even need to double the price because you didn't pay anything so the only person that made out <clears throat> good on that was the company that was insuring the insurer not the actual person that's right. been paying and th that needs the help right yeah i mean the reinsurers are i used to hate insurance companies that's why i formed my own now I hate reinsurers because they're like insurance companies on steroids. You know, they have secret exit hatches and fine print of their own that make the, all the Florida homeowners companies went broke because their insurance reinsurance actually disappears once they hit a certain number. I'm, I, I'm like, you, you got to be me. The, you know, why would when they you need buy it the most? Crack? Yeah, why would you buy that crap? It's like, well, we didn't think we were going to have a storm. I'm like, dude, you're a Florida homeowner's company. Guarantee you there's going to be storms. Every year. Well, there was 11 years where they had no storms. They should have made a lot of money. And so when the storm did come, they would have had it to pay. But they suck out all the profits, um, which, again, I think should be something that's not allowed. You know, Token you hookers. Yeah, you don't get to suck out every penny of profit when you're supposed to be banking money to to pay when the storm does come. So exactly, exactly. We're eleven. We're in a the gun industry is in a storm right now, and they were they were like making money hand over fist during Obama, and, and then you know, and then they're crying. It's like Remington, the, the Freedom Cup Group. They had to break them up and sell them apart. And I was like, what were you guys doing with all that money you're making? Spending it on Coke and hookers or what? You know? Right. Well, uh, insurance companies, is is there a, an acceptable standard that's used for like having X amount in escrow to make sure that you have expenses covered? Or is that does that vary between company and company? Well, that, that, what you're talking about is your surplus. So if we started an insurance company today, yeah, you, you can start out with a million, 10 million, whatever. Um, but you can only write so much premium against that. The the fundamentals, again, are so simple. If you pay me a million dollars and I'm your insurance company, how much should I spend of that million dollars to issue a piece of paper? Now, most companies' expense ratio is 40, 40%. <laughs> so you'd only have $600,000 left. So fundamentally, my company is focused on having a low expense ratio, which is the lowest of all insurance companies at 20. So when I talk to agents and brokers and buyers, I'm like, well, who are you with? I'm like, well, their expense ratio is 40. So they're sucking out a lot of the money, you know, just to issue a piece of paper. It's absurd. And then, you know, in non-storm years, Florida homeowners companies, their expense ratio and their loss ratio should be 40. 
right? Because you didn't have any storms. In the storm year, it's going to go up to 100. But in the non-storm years, all the Florida homeowners companies ran at a 98 combined. I'm like, how is that possible? And what do you think is going to happen when the storm comes? You're going to go broke. You know, I could... The AM Best book has been my Bible for years. I remember looking at it, and I would call presidents of insurance companies trying to get them to let me do what I'm doing today. Of course, they all told me I was crazy, but that was my goal in the 80s was, I want to be in that book. I want to be in all 50 states, and I want to be A-rated so I can do what I want. I don't have to call these, you know, overeducated, you know, corporate you know, nightmares that have way too many people. Um, you know, I, I think that, again, this is really simple stuff. We make it way too complex. But it is about insuring people, not businesses, because, you know, one firearms guy from another firearms guy, one, you know, rafting guy from another, what's the difference? It's the person in charge. It's the decisions they make, because everybody that works for them just following them. Yeah, you you would you would think or you would hope that that eventually somebody would make a good decision and that others would follow the good decision. I think that's what Rick's trying to do here, huh? Oh, <laughs> uh, it's like, come on, man! He's like, well, dude, yeah, if and, you just and, make the right decision, you can also be profitable. And, uh, and you know, but I found in life that you know when you're trying to save money, um, it normally costs you more money in the long run because that's a bad decision. You're not looking for value. So when you look for value, you know, normally that means you spend more money to get the right thing that's going to perform and execute the way you need it to when you need it to. But insurance, you know, again, Liberty Mutual sells their insurance. Only pay for what you need. I mean, that's the stupidest slogan I've ever heard as an insurance guy. I'm embarrassed. It, it almost makes buyers of insurance seem stupid because you don't know what you need. And if you're looking for the cheapest thing, you ain't going to get what you need. <laughs> it's, it's uh, yeah, but they've got a, a – who's the one with the, with the, with the, the, the emu, with the bird? Which yeah, insurance that, company? That's Liberty Mutual. Is that Liberty <laughs> with the bird? They're all the same, though. They all sell cheap insurance. You know, it's all about saving money, cheaper price. And, it, you know, to me, it's, it's our industry is, you know, it's going in the wrong direction, doing exactly the opposite of what we should. We I should embrace the claims. I don't think we teach our children the, the concept of buy once, cry once. You know, uh, that was James's motto for a long, you know, he's like, well, what are you buying there? And he's like, look, here's my motto. It's buy once, cry once. He said, buy, buy right. something this quality and, and just live with it. He goes, or you could just keep replacing broken crap for years and years. Um, I was young. I, I don't know if you had the, uh, the opportunity to meet James Yeager, Rick, before he passed, but he was one of the, uh, firearm training leaders in the industry that he was just an honorable man that would, when he gave you his word, it, it happened. It didn't matter what he had to do to make it happen. It happened. And there are people like that are few and far between. But one of the memories that I have of him saying, buy once, cry once was I was young. It was like one of the first times that I'd met him and he was talking about, uh, boots and knees. And cause somebody was complaining about their boots and he's like, well, what'd you, you know, what'd you bring? And it was this cheap piece of crap pair of boots and I'm young. So I'm like, not even at the point yeah. where I'm thinking about, you know, if you don't get good shoes to do this kind of stuff that we're doing on this training range, then maybe you're going to have to replace your knees. And, I, and so I'm this young kid that's like, yeah, whatever. Nobody has to replace their knees. And so he's like, just freaking spend a couple hundred dollars on a pair of boots, man. Like that's not that much. Well, and the knee pads, he, people were like, well, should I buy knee pads? And he said, yeah. well, he said, knee pads are cheaper than new knees. So, yeah. and, and Jared, when, when we started this, I was thinking that, that Rick would probably appreciate the, the original, uh, the, the waiver, the, just the waiver that James used to hand out. Yeah, that's right. I forgot. The about first that. line of the waiver said, I acknowledge that I may die today. All right. And then it went on from there. <laughs> 
<laughs> you don't want to hide anything from them because the lawyers will, you know, that puts it all out there in front. Of them. I may have told you this when I started insuring rafting class five. I made them swim across the river and back. It was a three day trip and they were going to swim. And the good guys said, sure, I'll do that. And they would scare some people off the trip. The crappy guy would say, I don't want to make them swim a river. That'll get rid of a lot of my customers that don't want to swim. I'm like, well, you got to be honest with them. You, you can't hide the ball and then have an accident and then try and defend yourself. You have to think ahead of the ball and say, look, you know, you're probably going to swim on this trip. You could die on this range if you make bad decisions. So, you know, it is about individual personal decisions, company decisions, and a plan and a play that execution is what it's all about when the chips are down. You know, and you're, you're, you're what we do, and uh, we, we've been doing it forever, but a lot of schools don't, is at the very beginning, we, 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 we tell everybody where the, the trauma kid is. We designate trauma people. All right, this person's primary, secondary, so forth. In the event of... If we need to evacuate a, a person, this is how we're going to do it. This is where we're going to go. This is where the hospital is and so on and so forth. And I've had people come to me and say, you know, I've taken a lot of classes and nobody's ever like hit on it. And, you know, they said they'll go over the safety rules, but they'll never talk about what do we do if somebody gets shot. And right. I was like, well, you know, <laughs> so for, and I and I never thought about it as like an insurance thing or whatever. I always thought about it that that's the right thing to do. Is you, you have it's like the I'm going to take an umbrella with me to guarantee it doesn't rain. Uh, right. But uh, it'd be hard for someone to claim. Well, I had no idea that 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 it was going to be risky after sitting through the this is this is the emergency medical plan. Or I mean, well. You know, if you had to testify, say, what was your plan? You know, our plan was call 911, sit on the ground, wait for somebody to show up. Uh, that's not our plan. Our eyes. Yeah, cover our eyes and cover our ears. No, our plan is to take action. And, you know, where we are in, in the desert, you know, or not desert, you know, mountains, whatever, scrub. Yeah, uh, just mountains. Yeah, the, the truth of the matter is that, you know, I said, look, we – we will. We could get you to a uh, hospital before the ambulance could get the phone call. The guys could go to the thing, figure out where we are, and show up. We would already be there. I said, so most of the time, we won't wait. We're going to put you in a vehicle if you're ambulatory, and we're going to zip, we're going to take you there because the time is, you know, not on our side. Uh, and, and it's just things of that nature that, and that's the responsible thing to do. The responsible thing, you know, and I know people are like, there's some guys like, oh, we don't want to talk about that because if you talk about that, then 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 people are like, oh, I I never thought about the fact that I might actually get hurt here, so uh, I don't I don't I don't want to do that. It's like no, it's you know it's it's like saying you know trying to convince somebody that chainsaws are safe. Chainsaws are not safe, but we need them. You know, uh, that's you know, it's it's like insuring a machine shop with lathes and presses and 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 you know milling machines and everything. It's like all that stuff can be dangerous. We need it; it's important, and we should have it. But at the same time, it's dangerous. Uh, we don't get rid of it because you know it's dangerous. We we just take the proper precautions. And I would hope that people would have you know be mature enough and responsible enough to understand that. But it seems sometimes like we're pushing a rock up a hill when when it comes to convincing people to do the right thing. But, uh, well, pick pick the right partners and make good decisions, and I think life is a lot easier. That's what I've learned now that I'm old. When you're younger, you know, certain people you're impressed by, and, you know, you really don't know how they're going to treat you under pressure. So as you get older, you hopefully make better decisions and learn from your mistakes. And so, you know, not saying that young people can't make good decisions, but they have to listen to some of us older guys, you know, that have more experience than they do. <laughs> yeah. Imagine that. Imagine that. Yes, indeed. Even well, Rick, all my I, friends are, Jerry, do you have any more questions for Rick? Uh, no, uh, he answered all the questions uh, just have him give the audience their marching instructions. If they want to go and actually sign up with X insurance, what do they do? 
Yeah, just visit, just either call us, uh, 801-304-5510, or go to xinsurance.com and get an application and uh, complete it, and we'll have a call, and then we give you a quote. We can give quotes same day. We can move as fast as you want. Most agents and brokers today would tell you they can't get you a quote for, you know, like 30 or days. It's a hard market, but I've always done stuff, you know, fast and direct and keep it simple. So give us a call or visit the website and let's do it right. All right. Remember X going to give it to you. There you go. Thanks uh, guys. Thank you very much for joining us today, Rick. I truly appreciate it. You bet. Talk to you later guys. Have a good one. <laughs> Bye. All right. Thank you very much uh, to Mr. Rick's Lindsay of X and shirts. X, what, what are they going to do? Give it to you. They're going to give it to you. They're going to live it to you. I'm telling you, I think they need to. If they want to hit a new audience, mm. license that music. Mm -hmm. Do it. Do it. License it. The, the estate of DMX, I'm sure, would be happy to license that to you. That's pretty cool. All right. So uh, thank you very much to Rick Lindsay for joining us from Flow Rida. And I hope you guys got something out of that. It was a, I think it was a fantastic conversation. We got right to the heart of it. And that's what we do here at Student of the Gun. We don't mince words. We get right to the heart of it. All right. Thank you very much for being with us. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to be back. You're like, tomorrow? You have a show tomorrow? Yes, we do. It's called a grad program bonus hour. And uh, Jared, if they wanted to be part of the grad program and get the extra stuff that only special people can get, how could they do it? It's super easy. Go to getsotg.com. And follow the instructions there. Join us. Super easy to do. You just, like I said, follow the instructions. And all you have to commit is one single dollar for a 30-day trial. And if you don't like the trial, then you can we can go our separate ways and still be friends. Yep. Uh, it's definitely not us. It's definitely you. But that's still something <laughs> that you can do. It's not us. It's not me. It's you. Yeah, it's not me. It's you. Uh, yeah. Get SOTG.com. Follow the instructions there. We have an amazing group of uh, like-minded liberty-minded individuals that are part of the grad program and i wish that more of you guys that are part of the grad program would be in the discord community uh, but it's just some people that are in the program don't want to be there because they don't like the internet stuff and that's totally fine that's cool i just uh maybe we should do a justin will love this idea maybe we should do like this thing maybe call it a shindig or something like that yeah. and get program members together He's screaming at the radio right now. Yeah, he is. All right. So tomorrow on the bonus hour, we're going to talk about Democrats are thieves. We have proof. Uh, and calling all GWAT veterans, calling all GWAT veterans. I want to hear from you. And I'm going to tell you why I want to hear from you tomorrow. Uh, so until we're together again, ladies and gentlemen, remember, you're a beginner once. You're a student for life. Thanks for staying until the end. Want to water the seeds of freedom we planted together today? Head over to wherever you listen to us and leave a like, rating, or review. It makes a big difference. Have a show topic submission? We would love to hear it. Submit it to info at studentofthegun.com. A delightful human will get back to you faster than you can finish a one-box workout. Remember to check studentofthegun.com often for new and free content, giveaways, and more. Watch, listen, read, shop, and connect at studentofthegun.com.